<laughs> hello, hello. Hi. Um, welcome to Project Dragonfly's webinar uh, today, October 10th. And we're really happy to have you guys here. I'm Jamie. I'm or Kai and Zano. Sorry. I'm Kevin Madison. And um, we are here to talk about our graduate programs, which we're really, really excited about. And we're really excited that you guys have all joined us. Um, we're sitting right now in Peabody Hall, which is the hall at Miami University where um, Project Dragonfly runs. So I guess let's get started on the PowerPoint. Yay! So what you see here is, um, Kevin, I think, uh, some, an animal from the Galapagos on the top there. Yeah, that looks like a marine iguana. A marine iguana. And yeah, I've taught the, uh, the Galapagos program, which is a fantastic one focused on evolution. Um, we have uh, 15 or 16, 16. Uh, field courses, so we'll talk about a few of those in tonight's presentation. We'll also be uh, taking some of your questions, which we see you guys have been posting in the Google Doc, and also we'll go, uh, there's some live chat here in YouTube Live. You guys can post questions there. We'll be monitoring that. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're just excited to interact with you all. We see there's about 24 people on right now. Some people awesome. will watch this later. Um, and just to tell you guys a little bit about who we are, yeah. um, I can share, I'm, I'm actually a pollination biologist. I did a lot of urban ecology work in New York City, looking at community gardens and what bees and butterflies were there. And I've been here at Miami now teaching and helping to um, uh, administer this program for uh, eight years. And it's been really wonderful to interact with students all over the country, all over the world in some cases. So um, yeah, it's been a good ride. And again, I'm Jamie. Um, I've been at Dragonfly for about 23 years now. Uh, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but uh, a little bit about the history of Dragonfly. But we started as a children's science magazine, and we've gone through a whole lot of uh, different permutations and projects and uh, outreach and, and things through all of these years. Um, and one of the things that I did in sort of the middle there was a whole lot of research at zoos. Uh, visitor um, tracking and, and talking to visitors about uh, how they felt about exhibits and such. So um, that's a little bit about my background and all the way to now when we have these awesome graduate programs. So um, let's go ahead and go to the next one. So Kevin mentioned it a, a little bit ago, um, but this is what we're going to be doing here um, for the, about the next hour. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the master's degrees. Um, and how, what these programs, we got a lot, a lot of questions um, in the RSVPs that you all filled out, and I see a number of questions in the Google Doc um, about what, what can I do with this degree. So we're going to talk a little bit about what these programs will prepare you to be able to do. Um, and then we'll talk too about Earth Expeditions. Kevin mentioned where he's taught um, before Galapagos and a number of other of our 16 course locations. Um, I've taught in uh, Belize most recently, um, Namibia, uh, Kevin was in Namibia this year, um, and uh, Costa Rica, a number of other ones, Baja. So we'll talk a little bit about Earth Expeditions. Um, and then we have some tips uh, for you about filling out the application to apply. Um, and then, of course, questions. We'll, we'll do your questions. So. And it's, and it's great. I just see this question that popped in. And we, we'll, We'll try and answer some of these through the presentation itself, and then it, again, at the end, we'll just see what we haven't answered. But someone wrote, I'm getting so excited for the program and so know I will be absolutely heartbroken my application isn't strong enough to participate. We certainly know those of you that are taking the time out of your busy evenings to join us on this, uh, you know, with your headphones in your home, wherever you're sitting, busy, maybe uh, you're on an iPhone, I don't know. But um, <laughs> we're just glad you're spending a little time to think about this with you and uh, with us, and we appreciate your enthusiasm. And um, so anyway, we, we, we're excited too. Um, so yeah, so that's the layout of the presentation. And, whoops, <laughs> I think I moved this. There we go, slideshow. And we can move there on. There we go. Yep. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Miami University and us as a project. We are located in Oxford, Ohio. Uh, founded in 1809, it's a, a very old and established uh, institution here in southwestern Ohio. We're, of course, accredited uh, by the Higher Learning Commission of the North Central Association of, of Colleges and Schools. 
Um, and so, so that's Miami, a, a teensy bit. You can go on the Miami, um, miamioh.edu uh, website to find out more about the university itself. Um, and we'll, we'll follow up actually um, after this webinar in the next day or two, as Kevin mentioned, I think it, it's going to be, it's, we're recording it, so we'll, we'll put it on our YouTube channel, and we'll send an email to all of you with, with um, a link to the recording so you can visit it um, again if you have questions, revisit it again if you have questions, um, and then we'll have links in there too. We'll put a link to my, the Miami University homepage in the email um, that we send you to follow up. Um, but Project Dragonfly uh, is based in Miami's Department of Biology. Uh, we began in the mid-1990s as a children's science magazine. And uh, the idea behind the magazine was to um, allow a national, it was the first national forum for young investigators, for children, to um, uh, present their investigations and their questions about the world uh, in a national forum. And so their, their investigations, kids' investigations, were placed alongside adult researchers' investigations, giving them equal footing um, in this, in this uh in this public uh, national venue. Um, and it was the first time that happened. So and we were funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, we were published by the National Science Teachers Association. And the editorial side of things was here at Miami University with a group of, of professors. Um, and the idea was really, you'll see uh, our logo there, Project Dragonfly and uh, with the dragonfly, and Inquiry Community and Voice. And those are the three sort of core tenets of who we are as Dragonfly. We began that, that with the magazine. Um, we, we carried it through all of our programs called Saving Species and Wild Research um, that engaged the zoo public in science and conservation on zoo grounds. Um, and, but all, all the while talking about um, inquiry, community, and voice. And um, to now, again, as I said earlier, to the graduate program, the gra graduate programs now that we're running um, that have the same very core, core tenets. Um, and then the last bullet there, Dragonfly graduate programs are open to people from all disciplines. There's no real um, concentration that you need to have had as an undergraduate for your baccalaureate degree. Um, just a, a bachelor's degree and a, a, an awesome uh, interest in conservation and education and benefiting human and ecological communities. Um, so that's a little bit about Miami and Dragonfly. Oops. <laughs> Keep doing that. And I'll just jump in. You know what's really cool about this, Jamie? It's we've got the M there and the Miami University, and we're very clear about where Miami is University is located. Yes. Which is not in Florida. <laughs> it's not in Florida. <laughs> so we just, those of you attending will, um, if, you, if you enter end up entering the program, you can make sure people know that. But it's very unique that in this program, you never need to step foot on this campus, even though it's a beautiful campus here in Oxford, Ohio. Um, you might never come here physically because you can join this program from anywhere. Um, and we do have a lot of students in just a couple months. We'll have probably about 150 students graduating many of which do come with their families here for the first time to Miami to celebrate with us. Um, and then they get the, some, some great swag from the, the gift store. Some socks uh, and yes, t-shirts and hoodies. <laughs> um, but it's, we wanted to show you the physical place yeah. because it is something that through this program you don't necessarily need to connect with that much, but it does exist. And um, there are a lot of people here rooting for you guys. So Yeah, and before you move, Kevin, the the... The one at the top is is actually the biological sciences building um, with some flowers in front of it. And the picture at the bottom is Peabody Hall, which is where, as I said, where the Dragonfly offices are on campus and where where um, Kevin and I are right now. Here, <laughs> right now. In um, so cool. So, yeah. All right. So a little bit more detail about the AIP and the GFP. AIP standing for Advanced Inquiry Program and GFP for the Global Field Program. Um, and the AIP, I think you probably all know a little bit about um, each of the degrees, but before I jump down to the bullets, I'll just um, very quickly say that the Advanced Inquiry Program is um, has experiential learning at zoos and online. It's an online degree with experiential learning at zoos, and the GFP program is um, a hybrid uh, masters that um, 
takes place in conservation locations, hotspots throughout the world, and online. So either one, either the AIP or the GFP, can lead to a Master of Arts in Biology or a Master of Arts in Teaching in the Biological Sciences. And um, all of the folks in the program go through the, um, the coursework together, um, where, you, where you, you sort of individually divert, and we'll probably talk about this more, is in the, your individual projects and your passions and your, your, your particular interests. Um, but everybody goes through the program together. Um, both programs total 35 credits um, and can be completed in two and a half years, although um, that's, the, that's sort of the fastest you can complete the program. Um, there's no way to get through it faster than that. You guys are, uh, for the most part, working professionals um, with families and lives and a whole lot of stuff um, in addition to going to graduate school uh, potentially for you. So, um, and, and we know that we can't, can't sort of get, get you through the program any faster than two and a half years, but we have a whole lot of folks who take longer than the, than the typical isn't even the word for two and a half years because so many people um, need more time and take more time than the two and a half years. Um, and it's up, you could take up to five years to complete the degree. Um, and lots of people do. Um, so on the left, there's the GFP with two sort of arrows. The GFP has 21 credits of three Earth Expeditions classes. And we'll talk more about Earth Expeditions in a little bit. Um, and, then the, and then the remaining 14 credits of the GFP occur, they're the core um, classes that occur entirely online. And then sort of the AIP also has those core classes, those 14 credits. And um, in some cases, the G, G, our GFP and AIP students are uh, interacting in, in our core classes um, uh, alongside each other. Um, and then, so, so they have the 14 core credit hours in common. And then the AIP, the 21 credits of the AIP um, class is web, uh, web plus class is, is the terminology we've given it. Um, web plus classes with uh, experiential learning at, this, at a zoo or botanical garden. And those 21 credits, all of the 21 credits, either in the GFP or the AIP, occur online. It's just that the GFP has face-to-face um, -face experiential or face-to-face -face learning in a conservation site somewhere internationally. Um, and the AIP has those 21 credit hours online with experiential learning at a, at a learning, learning institution. So there's, there's, um, there's some, I know we weren't going to get into comments and questions, but I just have to acknowledge because <laughs> I love it. Uh, so there's, KR says, I'm in Australia. Is that okay for a GFE? Of course. That's yep. really fine. <laughs> um, so, and, and the neat thing is actually we have an Australia Earth Expeditions course. Yeah. Um, so and and they're have, coming, our partners yeah. are coming to visit in a couple of weeks. Right. So from Reef HQ, and that, that course has a big focus, obviously, on the Great Barrier Reef and coral reef conservation. But you would be, if you're in Australia or any other country, um, as long as you can travel to whatever field locations you want to go in for the GFP, you, you'll be all set. Um, and then we have a comment, both programs sound amazing. Thanks, that's great to hear. Uh, and Yay, then we think they are. Yeah, <laughs> then, um, if we take five years, can we do Earth expeditions most or all of those years, or is there a max? Um, and the answer to that is that only three will count. Um, towards your degree, you can certainly take more, and we generally have alumni who join in and take more. Um, but yeah, if you spread those out over time, and the degree over time, and wanted to do those along the way, I think that would be fine. Yep. Um, so that's, that's the structure of the program. I bet you there's someone out there wondering which program is right for me. <laughs> and um, Jamie, maybe you have some thoughts on that. Sure, sure. Um, um, well, the GFP, as Kevin just shared, you can live anywhere. Um, you can, uh, the core classes are entirely online and the 21 credits are, take place in conservation hotspots throughout the world. And so let's say um, Kevin is teaching a class like he did this summer in Namibia and he'll talk about this uh, in a little bit, but let's say he's teaching that class. He will not see, or I will not see, like I taught in Belize this summer, won't see those students until we get to that country. Um, and so they're coming from all over the place. We have um, students in Asia, we have students in Europe, um, we have students um, in Canada, we, they're sort of all over. And of course, uh, lots of students in the United States earning the GFP degree. So, um, but that concentration is sort of, um, so many of the tenets are, are the same in both programs. 
Um, but the, that concentration is sort of uh, has sort of a, a more global world for focus. And with the AIP, we 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 did some um, investigating and research before we when we were creating both programs and found that not every every you know a whole lot of people like minded people. Um, uh, really enjoy these ideas, but might not want to travel out of the country. Um, and so we started working with zoos and, and, and the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden first, because they're very um, close to us, and, uh, and we have a, a great relationship with them. Um, but we started working with them and, and, and discovered that um, some people wanted uh, opportunities like the GFP, but others wanted a, a more focused community um, uh, learning institution, and so that's when we, we got together with the zoos, and so the experiential learning takes place at the zoos, but it also takes place in the communities in which you're um, in which you live and in which you're involved. Um, the GFP does too, so so much is is uh, you know very much uh, works together in both degrees. Um, but with the AIP, you for the most part should live within a, a certain radius and be able to drive to that learning institution because there are required face-to-face -face times that take place at the zoo and, and at sites around um, St. Louis, for example, or Seattle in, in our, one of our AIP locations. Um, so so it, it it's sort of uh, accommodates both kinds of learners and interests, I guess. Right. Yeah, and um, we had did it have this other question about like, how often do you need to travel to the zoos and accommodations at the zoos? So there's no accommodations at the zoos if you're in the AIP. Yeah. You just need to, like Jamie was saying, you need to live in proximity or be there for the face-to-face -face time. Um, we have had a few people who relocate partway through the program, and then we try to work with them to make sure they can, you know, as, as best as we can to finish up the program. Because a lot of folks that join this program are, are relocating our early career or at a stage where they're moving around to places so we try and work with those too um, but yeah both are great program options and, and just keep reading about them let us know we'll give you our emails if you guys have questions afterwards you can certainly let us know um, if you're not sure which program is best for you and one earth expeditions it says this on the bottom right of the of the slide but one earth expeditions class may count towards the AIP um, just to a lot of our AIP folks um, do the experiential learning and coursework on on zoo grounds, um, and then have that last seven that last seven hours um, uh, uh, as an Earth expedition. Right. So, so if you're like, yeah, I could go to Belize once, but I'm not going to go to Belize, Baja, and or Belize, Namibia, and Thailand. Although that sounds amazing, <laughs> maybe that's just not in the cards for you. So yeah, then the AIP you can still get your travel bug. Um, scratched and and also be connected with people in your city yeah um, so let's see and we have lots of other cool questions coming in but maybe we'll just keep sort yeah. of jumping to them as we can um, as yeah we can it. so we'll, we'll go quickly over this one but these are our nine um, master institutions is what is what they're called um, Chicago Seattle San Diego Zoo Denver um, Cleveland, uh, yay, uh, uh, another Cleveland, uh, another zoo in, in Ohio, we have, and then Cincinnati, of course. Um, Missouri Botanical Garden just joined, has, has their first cohort right now. Um, they, we recruited last year for them, and they, are, they have entered and, and are in their first semester uh, right now. Uh, and we learned that, that people like plants, not just animals, <laughs> right? right? So we, we it's kind of cool to see stuff. that happen. Um, yeah, orchids are pretty cool too. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Missouri came on board, and Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens is our newest um, AIP institution. And uh, so they are recruiting right now for a cohort that will begin next summer in, in 2020. So those are our not nine institutions. Um, and across the, the nation, I think our, our states where we have the most people, we, we have had students in, I think, every state? Every now. state, yep. Um, but, but the most common, you all can probably guess, um, but Ohio is, is up there, um, Illinois is up there because Chicago has been with us for so long and, and is a large program, the Brookfield Zoo there. Um, and then California is quickly catching yep. up. Um, but yeah, we have we have a lot of students in all different areas. We we have a map. We won't show it here, but that shows all of the students in alumni in the program. And it's quite 
amazing the reach of this. All the dots. <laughs> um, so towards the questions, and we'll get into this in a little bit about what this program will do for you, a lot of it is networking um, yeah. and connecting with people that are working in different these different conservation organizations you're seeing on the screen here. And the next slide uh, is all of our Earth Expeditions locations. So we said there, <clears throat> excuse me, there are 16 uh, conservation hotspots and, and we have, it takes a while, uh, a few years to, maybe, maybe a lot, well, a, a lot of years to develop one of an Earth Expeditions course um, because we have um, conservation partners at each location with which we've been um, working for many, many years. For example, Namibia Great Pack Conservation um, in Africa, um, that partner is because um, the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden has some awesome, awesome cheetah work that they've been doing for a very, very long time. And, um, and our partner there is the Cheetah Conservation Fund. Um, so, and in Brazil, our partner there has been, you know, is doing great work with golden lion tamarins. Um, Hawaii, that's San Diego is, is a part of that one. They've got some unbelievably cool stuff uh, going on there. Um, Belize, we, again, all, the, all these locations we have because we've been working with um, conservation partners on the ground who, who know the country, who are embedded in the country, who are um, locals and live in that country and know um, the conservation challenges and um, successes that are going on in each of the if each of those locations. Um, so we have it looks like four in uh, four uh, um, classes in, in South America, uh, a couple in Central, uh, Baja, Hawaii, and Belize, um, and Galapagos is out there. The two island. Uh, uh, nations, Hawaii, or state and nation, Hawaii and Galapagos, two in Africa, um, four in Asia, and of course our one in Australia. Um, so and, that's uh, where they are. Yeah, there's there's some nice comments about not a single one of those that doesn't look amazing. <laughs> so that's great. Can you go to Brazil for your first Earth expeditions? Um, actually, yes, this year, um, just so this year, <laughs> Baja and Belize were, have traditionally been our first year courses if you were joining the GFP, but Brazil is going to be a first year course coming um, in this summer 2020. For the first um, time. Yeah, this, for this the first time. Year. So you can apply and, you know, we'll, we'll do our best. We try to put people, if they are accepted into the program, into the, the placements that they have requested. Of course, that's not always possible, but I will say just like that, that comment there, if, if you put in for Belize as your first choice and you go to Baja, no one goes to Baja and then regrets that they went to Baja, <laughs> you'll have a great time um, either way. So anyway, um, yeah, some great locations. Um, and let's see what we have here. So now we want to transition a little bit to talking about what will this program prepare me to do because we've been getting so many um, questions about this. And I wanted to start with our mission here, which is to build an alliance of individuals with firsthand knowledge of inquiry-driven community-based learning for the benefit of ecological communities through achievement and global understanding. So really at the heart of that is community and is developing this, this network of people. So in your coursework, if you're in the AIP or the GFP, you're gonna have an opportunity to connect with about 150 peers through your online coursework and then what you're doing at the zoo or in your field locations. And through that, you really can, um, you know, connect with people that might be, if you're, say, a zookeeper already and you're working in New York City, you can connect with someone who's also a zookeeper, maybe you're working with rhinos and you both, that's on the other side of the country. Or if you want to get into those careers, that you can connect with people and find out some tips. So what Jamie and I can offer is generally, you know, we do our best, but it's less in some cases than what you will gain from your peers in this program mm -hmm. because this program is for working professionals. Um, and we do certainly also have some students who are just out of undergrad and a little bit more trying to figure things out. That's fine too because you're going to learn from the folks that are a little further in their careers. Um, so the first thing I would say is the community is the main thing that you're going to get from this program, those connections. Um, here's just a picture from the Amazon, a wonderful course that, that I instructed a few years back. Um, and, you know, even just 10 days in the field with these individuals, and we felt like we had spent, you know, months together by the end of that um, in a good way. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> and it uh, happens on every class. I mean, yeah. everybody has become such a team. 
um, and uh, it, it, they really so it's, and it's not just the peers it's again the in-country par partners that we um, that we work with whom we work and the instructors um, we have an amazing team of instructors um, that, that we've been putting together for years and they come from all over the place so you're connecting with so many so many interesting and, and wonderful people in conservation action one of the most exciting things is, is when you get off that plane and you start to meet other individuals that are on the, in the program and it, and it really becomes real um, because up until then it can kind of feel like is, is this program actually how does it work right <laughs> yeah um, and then when you experience it, and you, it, it it's just a whole different level so um, excited for you guys with that um, in terms of skills and knowledge um, you're going to learn about biodiversity threats and conservation evolution we have a course on that and that's a theme of course that runs through biology in general community engagement methods is really big um, and maybe I'll just mention, because there was this question here about um, does the program as an MA versus an MS put a uh, Master's of Science, uh, uh, it, would it be better to have it as a Master's of Science in, for some careers? And that's something I've thought about quite a bit. I think that it's a Master's of Arts. What that communicates is that this is more of a general liberal arts experience and you are going to learn a lot of different things not just technicalities of science in terms of like you know running a pcr machine or doing genetic analyses in a lab which is more associated with an ms um, or where you have a very specific thesis that is maybe handed to you by a doc by an advisor um, the ma is broader you're dealing with communication you're dealing with um, community outreach and leadership. leadership and things like that so it has a lot of soft skills, but I will tell you, I mean, my experience is the people that are, are attracted to this program often are looking for that. And while an MS could be appealing, and we certainly have people that go in and get PhDs yeah. after this program, um, but that many of the people that want to do this are, are wanting to make change. And so it does take that broad skill set. Um, so anyway, just to take a moment to answer that question. Um, there's some other skills here. Science writing and publishing is a big one. Um, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. And there's a couple course examples there um, um, of the types of things you would be enrolling in as you go through the program. This is a picture of um, a screenshot of, of the online coursework. And it's just showing a course here, Baja, um, which you would click on this icon. So you'd go to the URL, URL for Dragonfly Workshops. And you would have a login through Miami University, and then you would go in and you would click on this beautiful picture here, um, and you would enter into the portal where you'd submit your coursework and interact with other students. Um, so just giving you guys an image of that, um, this is showing the other students and instructors in the course, these icons. Um, currently, we, we, we do have the way you can update, upload profile pictures. Uh, more standard profile pictures, but we started this program, like Jamie said, a few years back, and we had these cool animal icons and different things, and we kind of like that look, um, even though it's got a little bit of a retro vibe so you get there, <laughs> but it's kind of neat. Um, and so these would be all individuals in the course that you'd be talking with and getting to know, um, either in person or, or just through online. Um, and we developed the, the online component um, actually in the late 90s before Blackboard even existed. <laughs> right. And before like online courses like, yeah. was a big thing. And it's funny because like in universities, everyone's like, oh, let's, let's do more online because they view it as this way we can reach broader audiences and make more money and all this stuff. And that was never really the goal for, no. for Dragonfly. The goal was just, okay, we're doing these cool things. How do we connect people? It wasn't about scaling or anything else like that. Um, so we, we try to hold true to it. And I know there's this question about like, how, how do you connect with um, the professors in this program? Because in a lot of online coursework people have done, like they, they actually have had not had that experience. Right. They've had the opposite, which is, so what we try Singularly to do- Singularly typing <laughs> between you and the instructor, and that's not what we're about. <laughs> right. Well, if you can find the instructor even, or you might just be clicking through modules or something, yeah. and hardly right. be able to find them. So, I think what's neat about this, and you're seeing in this picture, is that we try to keep the course sizes, um, you know, relatively small in terms of number of students. Um, the instructors that we have, and Jamie and I are instructors in the program as well, are, are people that we 
look for in terms of caring presence, who is willing to get on the phone with you, um, is willing to you know, give you comments on your projects and, and give you real feedback. Um, so I think we are able to maintain that um, even though this is a pretty big program and even though we have people all over the, the country um, and the world, as we mentioned. But in any case, as you go through the program, you can always contact us, reach out for help. One of the neat things is that because it's for working professionals, um, a lot of times people are so busy with their day-to-day -day lives, we won't hear from students that much. Like They kind of just get the work done. They, it's making change in their community. It's making change for them. And we might only hear from them a few times through the program. That's fine too, as long as everything's going according to plan, you're, you're able to do your work. Um, but if you want to reach out, if you need support, we're always here for you. So, Kevin and I are also advisors in the program. So um, there are three, uh, four main advisors here at Miami University, and um, each of us is has a certain subset of GFP students um, to advise. And then we also are connected with um, one or more AIP institutions. So. We're sort of wearing both hats in terms of adv advisor roles. Wear a lot of hats. <laughs> <laughs> that we do. <laughs> All right. So um, I wanted to give. We. It's been hard for us to quantify this. I, I'm sort of more a statistically minded person, so I would have loved to, you know, say that like you know whatever percent of our graduates go on to get a promotion or whatever. But it's hard to get that data because um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so we have a few examples here. Um, I will say one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of, we have quite a few people that join this program and I'll ask them, why did you join the program? And they will, I say like, do you, did you need this for your career? And they'll say, no, I just joined this because I love the idea of it. So if you're in that boat, lucky for you, <laughs> you're in the job you love or you're in the life you love um, and then just want to do more learning. Um, but there's a lot of people that also want, really do want to shift careers or something. So these are some examples, a teacher who wanted to get out of teaching and, and ended up working in an um, informal science um, institution like the Shed Aquarium in Chicago. Um, and we also have the opposite because we have a lot of, like Jamie said, teachers and people working in zoos and aquariums and different places like that. And they'll meet and, and there's a real sense that like the grass is greener on the other side. So. Um, like a lot of our zookeepers will be like, I want to be a teacher <laughs> after going on the course and we have the vice versa occur. Um, mom going on to be a facility manager at the nature center. And of course she's still a mom, <laughs> um, as well. Recent graduate going on to work at the Woodland Park Zoo. And we had a question, where is the Woodland Park Zoo? It's in Seattle. Um, it's, it's an amazing location. Um, so those are just a few examples. We have many, many more. We've had some folks create um, new businesses. Like I just learned about a student who is creating like a nature play preschool um, setup. Mm -hmm. um, I forget what city it's in. We had a student who uh, created a built a zoo. Yes, <laughs> she yes. started a it's zoo. Like, it is. It's a, it's, it's a small a smaller zoo yep. uh, and like rehab center um, for like mostly native wildlife, I think. But yeah, yeah it's it's pretty amazing. Um, Quite a few have gone on to pursue a PhD, and I think, you know, if you think you want to do that, I have lots of books I recommend for those that get so in love with learning that they want to dedicate even more of their life to it. Um, but I do think the PhD in general is something to think about because it can pull you away from community in many, in many of the traditional, more traditional PhD type programs. Um, so that's something to carefully think about if you're, you know, thinking, thinking along those lines. Um, we certainly had people get promotions, and we had folks become um, teacher of the year um, mm -hmm. in their state or give TED talks. Um, so write grants um, and do unbelievable. Yep, National Geographic fellows. Yep. Um, so, and this last point is just that even again, if you're not looking for all that change, we've had some folks that are retirees, retirees that joined the program and ended up. Um, uh, just just volunteering in more things and getting involved and we have like folks that worked in you know Procter and Gamble and business for 30 years and then ended up in this program to pursue their love of conservation so and in, in those situations um, it's it's really cool because you have sort of a different lens you know after you after you go through this program you sort of look at the world a little bit differently and in terms of conservation action and what you are capable of doing that's sort of one of the you know we 
as our we want our students to make change and cause conservation action in their communities and in their world. And so if those of you who have um, a job that you want to stay in um, or um, and don't necessarily want to change careers, you can really do so much within within the work that you're doing now in a different way. And that's what you that's what we hope you you learn from the program. Yeah, the, the Chicago uh, Brookfield Zoo has a requirement for one of the courses that is 20 hours of volunteering at a local whatever you want to do, right? And that that counts to the to the it's coursework, right? And what's so cool about that is that people will go out and they'll start working at, at an animal shelter or they'll start working at a school doing some education or an, some sort of nonprofit, um, and then they make a connection there and it can build into possibly get their foot in the door for another thing or just be this very rewarding thing in their yeah. life. Oh. Did I let it go? I'm still there. <laughs> I think you're still good. What did I do on the screen? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, so the other thing, we, we actually have studied this, and our, our graduates do experience a, a self-perceived um, general increase in leadership efficacy through this program. Um, again, it's, it's, this is like self-reported data um, of how they feel, but it's, it's pretty But we track it over time. And we it's, track it through time, what's, what happens. And a lot of that's because, again, the coursework is not like taking lots of exams on you know, central dogma in gene theory or something. You know, we do cover those topics and we discuss those topics, but it's not like memorization and real facts It's what's really valued in this graduate program. It's more going out and, and expecting you to make change. And so with that, initially you're gonna freak out and everyone does freak <laughs> out. And then you'll be with a group that's all freaking out. And with that comes uh, confidence building that you're not alone yeah. and it's okay. Um, so yeah, giving presentations at these professional societies that are pretty amazing um, and kind of the way you can also do networking. Um, these are just some examples that you're seeing on the screen now. Um, Association of Zoos and Aquariums, National Science Teachers Association, North American Association of Environmental Educators. Um, and yeah. we just had a student um, tra transition from careers and now she works at NAAE. Oh, <laughs> so there you Another go. example. Yeah, at, at the Association for Environmental Educators, very cool. And then we've had students, we have a publication requirement, so you will submit uh, a manuscript for publication. And it doesn't have to be in a science-y journal, although many of the examples we've put up here are kind of more <laughs> in the science-y journal realm. We've had students also publish an op-ed in a major newspaper, for example. Um, and that may reach several hundred thousand people, whereas some of these more specific scholarly journals may reach a smaller subset. So we value different types of publication, but these are the types, some of the places that people are publishing um, through their coursework, um, working with different groups and, and having different co-authors with them on, on some of these projects. Um, let's see, so now we want to talk more about Earth Expeditions. Let me see if there's just one more question we can handle um, before we jump into this next section, which is... Um, oh, can all the, I've totally gone off the Google Doc here, um, can all the AIP service, does it need to be completed at one zoo location? And the answer to that is that that's what we prefer, but we, and I think we talked about this a little bit as well, that if you had a move, we could, and you were moving to another city with an AIP location there, we could, we could um, have you transfer into that AIP program in a different location. Um, and there's, maybe we'll just do one more because I've got it. <laughs> Can you give more details on the role of advisor in this program? Um, so Jamie mentioned that we're both advisors. Um, a lot of what we do is handle issues when they get to a difficult point for students. Um, so being there when, um, you know, things just get out of control. Um, and you need to talk with someone or you need to find a way to withdraw from your classes, go at a slower pace. So there's some of that. Um, there's also, I just had um, multiple different emails, one of which is about you know, going to, through our um, ethics review board here at Miami for a survey that someone wants to do in, a, in, a, um, in their community. So we'll help with research projects. Um, we've co-authored with students um, on their publication projects. 
Um, we've brainstormed uh, with folks. And I would say with the AIP in particular, because you will have not only your Miami advisor, which my, Jamie and I are, but you'll have your advisor at the AIP institution, and you will be meeting them face-to-face -face, you know, each semester, essentially. Um, so you're going to really have a great chance to connect with that group and get a lot of feedback in those ways. Um, all right. Yeah. Let's talk. Yeah. Do you want to say more about that? Or no, 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 no. I think okay. we're ready to ready to move. Okay. And uh, I think it's eight thirty-eight. We need to like speed up yeah. a little bit. <laughs> um, a little bit about Earth expeditions, and I'll sort of go through these um, quickly. But as we said, designed for working professionals. Um, and open to people from all disciplines and settings, wherever you are uh, in the world. Um, and you can't actually take Earth ex Expeditions as a, just for standalone graduate credit. It doesn't have to be a part of the GMP or the AIP if you just need. Um, and I know that we had some, some folks RSVP who were just interested in Earth Expeditions and taking it for credit. So you can do that too. So, um, but the classes are pre-field coursework. We're writing a synthesis paper there getting into the research about um, what you're most interested in, followed by the, the about 10 day experience in the field um, at one of our course locations. Um, and then there's post field coursework. So you get back from the field in the summer. The 10 day experience is, is in the summertime, sometime during the summer. You do work after you get, get back. And then there's what we call an inquiry action project in the fall um, and so there's, there's a, that, that community uh, project that you're doing in the fall after you're back, back home in your, in your own uh, community. So it's, it, it consists of a five credit summer course and a two credit fall course to combine to make that seven credit Earth Expeditions experience for the GFP you would be um, earning or getting three, getting three or, or get, taking three Earth Expeditions classes. <laughs> there we go. It's 8.30. Yeah, it's 8.30. Sorry. <laughs> I wonder how many West Coast people are <laughs> There we go. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit specifically about Belize, uh, approaches to environmental stewardship, and Namibia. So, um, and, and last year we did one of these webinars, and we actually um, talked about Baja and Paraguay. So Because that's where we were the year previous. Yeah, so what we'll do is we'll uh, hopefully be able to share in a follow-up to this um, links to how you can watch those if you're interested in those two courses. All right, so this summer I taught our course in Belize, and Belize, um, as we've said, is one of our uh, first year courses. Belize is, Baja is, and again, the new one, Brazil. Um, but our partner there is the Tropical Education Center and the Belize Zoo. Um, it's a, a, an unbelievably cool place uh, with um, lots of botanicals. You can see there in the, in the top middle photo. Um, and um, and lots and lots of native animals. Um, that's that's sort of their concentration. Um, and you can see I put the one on the bottom there uh, with the green roof because that that's actually where you would be staying if you were taking our police class. So some folks like to see you know actual very locations. Very cute cabanas. Very cute cabanas. Um, okay, so uh, in Belize and Baja, we're doing a whole lot of um, sort of experiential field methods, um, just learning about field methods in general. So what you see here, the biggest picture, um, it's a little deceiving because those spider monkeys on the right aren't actually <laughs> uh, two feet away from, from, from it. But, that's, but I put the picture there because I wanted you to know what they were looking at. So there are, there's a couple of troops of spider monkeys at the Belize Zoo, and these students here uh, are from this summer, and they're, they're, they're taking data on uh, a couple of different questions and, and learning about spider monkey behavior. Um, and all these pictures are actually, have actually been taken by uh, the students. So the, the toucan, uh, another group did, did an investigation about some of the ver birds at the zoo. Uh, there's a jaguar, a few jaguars there. Um, again, they, uh, another student project about that. And then tapers on the lower left-hand corner. Um, and I love that picture because you can see his nose. It's very elephant, elephant trunk-like. Um, it's not, it's more closely related to a rhino than an elephant, but, um, so that's what they're doing there. And then also in Belize, there is some field, uh, experience, uh, field methods experience in the water, uh, in the Caribbean Sea. So the folks in the biggest picture there are gathering, I think they were doing a seagrass, some seagrass sampling. You can see she's riding on a little pad, 
the, the uh, woman on the right is writing on a little pad, um, and we have tools and things that you can use in, in each of our locate, course locations, uh, data collection sorts of tools, but we want everything to be driven by the question that you're most interested in asking. Um, and then on the bottom right, the students are getting ready, they're preparing their presentation um, that they were, that they were going to give about, um, about their work. Um, and then another student uh, data collection uh, project was about the, the, the rays that were, um, uh, that, were, that were in the water surrounding the island. So, so that's, and here's another one. We visit uh, a Mayan uh, ruin that is uh, just beautiful, uh, as you can see there. Um, and another, uh, the, the books on the bottom are because uh, a, a huge component of what we do is reflection and um, translating what you're doing in country or at the zoo or wherever you're located, translating that to your personal and professional life back at home. And um, what does this mean? What, what is this experience? How, how am I using this experience now? But also how can I use this, this experience back at home? And so journaling is a, a huge component of, of all of our Earth Expeditions classes. And Namibia. Cool. Yeah, and, and before getting to Namibia, I mean, there's this question here of what are some of the teachers and long careers in these fields that we'll be introduced to during our time in the program? And for years, Belize, the Belize course would meet with Sharon Matola, and I hope it will continue. I know she had some health issues this last year. But Sharon Matola is one of the foremost conservation experts in Belize and could be said in Central America. There's a yeah. book. Um, the last flight of the scarlet macaw about her. So, in a lot of the and like in in Kenya, our Kenya course, you get a chance to meet David Western, who um, is sort of one of the originators of community-based conservation as a field of study and as a method for conservation. So, what we've tried to do with these field, and I'm not sure if this is exactly what this question is getting at, but with the field locations, um, we have experts that are that are there that we will be connecting with, um, even if briefly, um, it's, it's amazing to really get a sense of, you know, you know, essentially Jane Goodall types um, that, that have dedicated their lives to conservation. Um, and then in terms of other teachers, um, a lot of your instructors have been working in, in the field for a long time. Um, a lot of, uh, again, the, the students and peers in the program have enormous experience. So all of that will tie in. Okay, now to Namibia. <laughs> So cool to go on a 15-hour flight. That's a long flight. Longest flight, flight I've <laughs> ever been on. Um, and that's not counting all the connections and everything. So about 24 hours um, in transit, which was less than some other people found. And then arriving in Windhoek. It's Windhoek because it's got a German um, history. Uh, Namibia. And these are uh, three students at the airport, just excited and a little jet lagged, I think, um, mm. to finally be arriving. And this is our first dinner here at a restaurant in um, Windhoek, um, um, enjoying connecting a little bit before we get going with the course the next morning. Uh, this is uh, the Cheetah Conservation Fund, which is our main site for the Namibia course. It's the base, and, and really the Cheetah Conservation Fund is the world leader in cheetah conservation. Um, it's piloted a lot of very innovative projects. Um, this top right photo here shows our, the bus we travel around in, and these uh, this is a camp called Lightfoot Camp at the Cheetah Conservation Fund, and these are the sort of dorm uh, setting that you stay in. There's like little beds and um, bunks in some of these. And then there's a campground you can't really see, but this is an arid environment, which why maybe it looks a little sparse in this view. Um, but again, just an incredible megafauna that you will see on this course. Um, and here we are having class uh, under an acacia tree. Um, so how cool to, to have that experience. And, and here in the bottom right is the dining, um, which is just sitting outside in this location and seeing hornbills and other interesting wildlife um, as you're eating your, your meals. And on the, where they're having class on the left, they're sitting um, yards away from uh, cheetah that they are, that they are rehabbing and, um, and, and so you're, you're with cheetahs all the time on, on this course. It's really awesome. Right, <laughs> and a lot of our students like work in zoos and so they've seen cheetahs, but seeing them in this setting where yeah. they have much larger enclosures and the way they're being 
managed and rehabilitated and utilized in this country where you know hunting of cheetahs is sometimes viewed by by people as like their way of maintaining their livelihoods if they're ranchers right even though that's not necessarily the truth right um, but there's so there's a lot of complexities and and just being able to experience it in the location is very special yeah. Um, and I alluded to some of the, the unique conservation. So these are just some pictures of the course uh, participants meeting with different individuals. I'll just talk about this one with this, this dog here. Um, it, it's a scat, uh, cheetah scat detecting dog um, that's been trained to, to detect cheetah scat, obviously. And it's, and it's a very hard job, uh, but a very important job. And what it can do is when ranchers get... Um, you know, see that uh, one of their, their goats was killed um, and they assume it was a cheetah so that they want to go out and kill any cheetahs that they know are in the vicinity. Well, these dogs can go out and sniff for a cheetah scat and if they don't find it, then, you know, maybe this was a different um, wildlife animal that is, that is like a jackal or something, which is less endangered and um, hopefully also won't get persecuted and killed. Uh, hopefully there's other ways to deal with that, but it's just a neat thing that they have these dogs. They also have wildlife guarding dogs that bark and, and deter predators like leopards and cheetahs, so we meet them. So we actually, it's funny, we, a lot of people go on this course thinking they're going to, you know, and they do see tons of cheetahs like James said, but they kind of fall in love with all these cool dogs yeah. on this course that are or the trained goats. in these <laughs> or... Yeah, they have a goat a milk farm, goat milk farm on this course because um, they're trying to show ranchers how to derive um, secondary sources of income to reduce the pressure on um, wildlife poaching. Um, so I could talk for hours about this, but yeah. we're, we're running yeah. out of time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Atosha National Park is maybe the highlight for this course. It's the sort of traditional safari experience, but in an arid environment, so you're not in the Serengeti of Kenya, um, and it looks drier, and you have these cool views of, you know, elephants throwing dust on themselves, and <laughs> um, oryxes, and rhinos, and, and some very rare endangered species, so. So, um, you know, once you get back from these courses, one of the things um, we, we try to do is take the inspiration you've had from the field experience and, and translate it to your home community. So these are the types of inquiry action projects that you can do. We've had people do education focused projects on looking at conservation topics with six to nine year olds, looking at pollute or looking at pollution levels in, in tourism season, north non-tourism season in California. Um, so lots of different things you guys can do. Um, Driven by your interest. Right. It's your interest. It's not like it's a set thing. It's, it's based on your community. A lot of times we say start with your community. If you don't know where to start, ask people what they could do uh, or what they think could be needed in your community. Um, reach out as a graduate student, actually, because you can say I'm a Miami University graduate student. I just started this program. Um, what can I do to help? And sometimes that gives you some credibility and some ability to connect. Okay, so we're about to move to questions. Um, I do want to jump to one. We might get through, but uh, it's, is it very competitive to be accepted in the program? So if you wrote that question, and I see someone else said, please answer that question too. <laughs> and someone else wrote, how many people are accept, uh, uh, applying and are accepted? So stay tuned. We're about to go into tips for applications. <laughs> um, but um, I would say... Uh, this program, yes, it is competitive. We have a lot of applications because we're drawing from all over the world. But that said, it tends to attract people that are a good fit for the program because it tends to be people that are very excited about conservation and education. And so, you know, what we try to do is, is make sure the program can fit for as many people as possible within the bounds of our application process. Um, so we'll talk more about the details of that in a second. But yes, we get a lot of applications. Yeah. It is fairly competitive, um, but we also see a lot of great applications yeah. in that pool. Yeah. All right, so some tips. Start early. <laughs> um, we see a whole lot of applications come in right at the, so the, the deadline to apply to the GFD and Earth Expeditions is January 28th each year, um, and the deadline to apply to the Advanced Inquiry Program is February 28th, a month, a month later each year. 
Um, and we, what, we, what we see every year is a flood of applications at the very, very end. Um, and that's to be expected. Uh, you know, um, it's so nature. it's human nature, it's, it's gonna happen, but as early as you can start, um, it, it just allows you that much, that much more time. Um, transcripts can take a little bit of time uh, to get in and your recommendation letters. Um, but we do help you try to get those in and um, you have a little bit more time for uh, uh, official transcripts. Um, and and we, we, we work with you if your, your recommendation letters aren't in because that's not something that you necessarily control um, is those letters. Uh, read about the program. Um, the core tenets really are on the public facing websites on the AIP.MiamiOH.edu um, website and GFP.MiamiOH.edu. Um, read, uh, read about it and think about how it could benefit you. Um, think about the essays. The essay questions are on, when you click apply on our websites, um, you can see um, what those are. Um, you have to create a couple of accounts, but there's a very uh, one, two, three, four uh, steps that you follow um, on, on our apply page. Um, and so if you're applying to the AIP, we really recommend um, that you go to an open house. All of our AIP institutions in all of the cities um, are planning to have and, ha and always have face-to-face -face meetings. So you'll learn a whole lot about those meetings and you'll meet current students, you'll meet the advisors, the on-site advisors. Um, that Kevin was talking, that we were talking, have been talking about, and, and potentially graduates of the program. Um, even, even in Jacksonville this year, we, I think we're going to try to get some um, alumni uh, and current students at, at their info nights. So, um, yeah, really try to get to, so get to those. All of those websites for the, for the zoos and, and for the Botanical Garden have an I'm interested form. If you go to their websites, like, so if you search like Jacksonville Zoo AIP, or Missouri Botanical Garden AIP, you'll find the page, and from that, there's usually an I'm interested form embedded on the page. If you fill that out, which is usually just your name and what you're interested in your email, you will then be getting notifications when there's an open house. Right. You can also follow, um, sometimes they post them on, on our Facebook, right. which um, we'll give you guys the link to at the end here. Yeah. Um, in terms of references, there's a question about where should you get your recommendation letters from, and I would just say, Professional references are always good, so like what that means is not a friend, essentially, unless, with the exception I would say, if you're in a position where you have not been working for many years um, and uh, you know maybe there's a good reason for that, you know maybe that you were taking care of someone who was ill in your family or whatever, um, and you just are at a dearth of having not, not many professional references, then we would take that into account. But in most cases, we're looking for a professor, if you're close to your undergraduate, or maybe you need another graduate degree, you have a professor that can write on your behalf, or a supervisor, or someone at a, at a place you volunteer for. So those are good uh, recommendations, uh, letter writers. Um, okay, so for early career or career changers, relate your essays to things that you'd like to accomplish in the program. Again, read the websites to learn about the tenets, and then relate those um, uh, what what you're what you're talking about in your essay to things that relate to what uh, the websites say, but also to what you want to what you think you might like to accomplish in the program. And let us know how you considered the program's mission and ideas. That's you know sort of. Be sure you've read about it <laughs> so you understand what we're trying to do and, and help you do. Um, so highlight your hobbies and passions related to the natural world. Um, even if you've not worked in that area, it's not, it's not a whole lot of people come to, um, come to us and have not really worked in conservation yet, but their, their interest and passion is there. They really want to. And so if you've not worked, it's totally fine that if you've never worked in conservation before. But, if you, but we, want to, we want to know about your interest and, and, and why you really want to change um, professions or, or um, your future. You're, we do have an undergraduate GPA minimum of 275 out of a 4.0 scale. Um, if it is under 2.75, uh, we have we have petitioned. Um, it's it's not as likely, um, but but we have, uh, and um, for for especially for those folks who have lots and lots of life experience or um, and and an exceptional application. Some of our best 
most dedicated students have had a, what might be considered a relatively low undergraduate GPA. Um, we try not to judge based on that just because traditional formal learning um, is fraught with some issues, right? Uh, for different learning people that learn in different ways. Um, and also, everyone's life experience is different. Um, you know, early on, I, I might have judged someone with a lower GPA, but uh, more often than not, once I learn more about that person, and I might learn that they were working a full-time job um, to pay their way through college, or they were dealing with a sick parent or something. So that's why we have the petition process. But it does say there, we are generally looking for a little distance from the undergraduate if you are at that lower level. Um, but we try to see everyone as a person. I think that's the main thing for, for yeah. showing that. Um, but we do have these requirements at, at Miami University. Yep. Is yeah. the GFP some? We've got a question. Is the GFP something that one could do with a full time job? Yes. And children and <laughs> hobbies and all of the other life experience. Um, uh, Kevin and I both have children, and um, and we we travel in the summertime. And and I started teaching these classes when my kids were teeny tiny. Um, so not only can you work full time, you can be uh, a parent <laughs> and, and, and succeed in this program. And, and we have lots and lots of folks, folks, most actually, probably most of them have full time jobs and, and do this program. We've designed it for working professionals. So yes, <laughs> it's, it's impressive. They can do it. And uh, there was it a question is. about the rigor of the program. And I will say because it is project based, that's always going to be harder. I mean, for most learners, Creating a project in your community is harder than memorizing uh, some, a chapter in a textbook or, or whatever questions. So I'd say the rigor is very high in this program, but it appeals to more learning types and people that are more excited about it. Um, we do get people that, that struggle with the time management issues, and we're here to help with that. And you can go at a slower pace when you need to. So. Um, so these are the two, the AIP website homepage and the GFP homepage. We are going through a site redesign now, and I really want to thank Zach, who you have, you guys can't see. He's, uh, he's over here and he's running the whole tech thing. There's the hey, there's the hey, your Yay. hand looks so big. <laughs> <laughs> so Zach has been controlling and managing all of the technological and set the whole thing up uh, today for us to be able to do. Um, and, and he and our other uh, tech member, Mark, are um, redesigning and, and rebranding our website. So it's going to look different pretty soon. Um, but right, this is what the, our websites look like right now. Um, and I, I have put the, the red arrows there on the left-hand side because there's information about costs on each of those pages specific to each of the degrees, um, depending on which, which site you're on. And the FAQs on each of these pages are hugely, hugely, hugely um, informative. So if we didn't if we haven't answered your question, be sure you go to the web pages and, and click on that FAQ because there's lots of really great information in there. And I know we're, we're slightly at the end of the time, but maybe we can just answer a couple more questions. Yeah. I do want to just talk about costs because it's highlighted here. We haven't talked about it, and it's on everyone's mind usually. So what we've, we've been able to do with support from Miami University is offer this program at reduced tuition. God, I feel like I'm on an infomercial right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is, it's it way is, less than you pay it's, if you were it's, here. <laughs> it's essentially below, it's about a quarter of the out-of-state costs you would pay. So for one of the online courses that doesn't involve any field travel, you're, it, the cost, cost is $300 per credit hour. Um, the AIP courses are a little more because they involve that face-to-face -face learning, um, experiential learning at the zoo as well. So there's a little bit more. So those are 470 currently. Um, and the GFP courses, the field courses, have the airfare that you guys would pick up in addition to the course. And some of those courses, like Namibia, has an additional fee because it costs us more to offer that course. But essentially, all of our Earth Expeditions and pretty much all of our courses are really designed to break even because the university understands that this program is trying to do very altruistic, be involved in very altruistic things. In the world so we are working very hard to maintain that and keep this to the point where you guys don't have to go in debt um, to an enormous degree we say generally the program either the AIP or GFP can be done in its entirety for under $15,000 um, 
Now, we likely will have a slight increase in tuition um, in about a year or two. Um, so we are going to try and keep that within the range of where we're at now. And then once we get that, it should be on a three-year lock cycle so that people coming in then can kind of plan. Um, but just to give you guys a heads up on the cost, because we have some students who don't realize they haven't cost um, like compared at different universities. Um, so just be aware that, that the cost is quite a bit lower and we're trying to maintain that as best we can for you guys. So this is just a quote. We have, we have so many awesome quotes from so many graduate students, but she, Melissa said, I've learned so many amazing things, not just about the places I've been in the global community, but about myself and my own capabilities. Um, and this is pretty, uh, you know, standard kind of transformational learning that happens with this program. And, and so many people um, learn not just about the, more about the biological world and, and what they can do to better uh, biological and human communities, but about themselves, and and that's awesome. <laughs> it is. It's very cool, and it's it's different for each person. I yeah. Mean, um, and and what you get out of it, you know, like there was an earlier question about like um, that. What is this program done for teachers? We actually this program started really being focused on teachers. Yes. Yeah. Um, and through, we designed the website for teacher workshops. So. Right. We were really trying to work with, so the whole idea was like, if we can make change at the level of teachers, we can reach a whole lot of students through that impact. Um, but through the years, actually, our proportion of students that are teachers has swung out slightly. We still have a ton, a ton of teachers. Yeah. It really depends on what state you're in and what you're, to some degree, whether your school will give you reimbursement for professional um, credits, um, uh, development credits, whether your state requires some states like Ohio used to require a master's degree after a certain amount of time being a teacher and no longer do. Um, so each state where you live or location may be different in terms of the like actual like physical concrete benefits of completing this program. But um, what this quote kind of gets at is more the overall gist of, of the program yeah. that is going to be different for every person um, as to what they take from it. And I would say, I mean, the main thing we hope for you guys is inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, to to do things that make a difference. Um, so yeah, so um, I don't know if we have too much more. Zach, have we missed anything that you see? Not that I've seen. Uh, check through the Google Doc. Maybe there's something in there. I've been really watching. Okay, okay. maybe we'll just... Um, what are the number of students who have gone on to advance careers such as leaders and organizations, managers, directors, etc.? That's a great question. We actually have, um, like, one of our graduates is now becoming, fast becoming a, an ex, a, one of the world experts on Jaguar conservation. Um, and, it, and quite a few of our folks have gone on to higher levels at zoos or conservation organizations and nature centers. I keep waiting for our first graduate that's going to be a CEO for a, a major <laughs> conservation organization. Um, a large percentage of our students are women, and I think women do face some uh, biases, unfortunately, in, in rising, the, you know, going up the ladder, which is something that is a societal pro problem. But we are we are hoping that we'll see more and more women and other just underrepresented in, individuals in general um, climbing to the top, and well-meaning people in general climbing to the top that are that are genuinely in it for the right reasons. Um, I yeah. see one over there. Am I understanding correctly that students are only abroad for about 10 days during the Earth Expedition? And yes, that is, that is accurate. Um, every Earth Expedition class, the, the class itself lasts uh, from the beginning of summer to the end of summer, and then the in-the-field component is about 10 days. That being said, um, Paraguay, um, I taught Paraguay last summer, and um, because of, it, it takes a, a, a while to get there, and a lot of our students travel before the class and then do the class, or do the class and travel after the class, um, which, is, which is perfectly fine and, and awesome. And in Paraguay, uh, for example, this year, um, the, our in-country partner there has created a, a separate um, after-the-course experience um, that, that is offered only to our students. Um, because there, there's so much cool stuff in Paraguay to experience. So that is accurate. It's 10 days, but you have 
uh, lots more time to experience it if you want to go outside the class itself. I'm putting this up so you guys can, any, any of you that are, I know some people are logging out, um, so if you're heading out to your next thing, thank you for joining Thanks us. Thanks for joining us. Um, <laughs> it's nice spending time in this interesting digital world we have <laughs> connecting across space. Um, and appreciate your comments. And even those of you that, that didn't comment, um, feel free to email us. Any, any of you, um, our phone numbers are there. Our emails are there. Um, some, some of the questions that I see here are a little more specific to your individual cases about if you had a science course or different things. So you can just write us, um, and we will get back to you on that. And the science course question, and maybe some of the other ones, there's an FAQ about that. So you might check that out. Cool. Um, in fact, I got two emails today. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <nice. laughs> yeah. It's... So, okay. So I guess that's it. I guess we will um, sign out here and um, say goodbye to wherever you join us from. Yeah. Thanks again. And we'll look forward to talking to you guys more down the line. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Bye.